Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm going to be breaking down investment mistakes worth over $300,000 so that you can avoid doing them too. The morale of the story is that sometimes you earn and sometimes you learn, but the main takeaway for me is that sticking to the framework that I lay out in my two hour deep dive course would have saved me more than $300,000. What follows now is an, ana an analysis of these mistakes and how I am correcting the course. As I sat down in November, to produce my two hour deep dive course, I started feeling uncomfortable about two investments of mine GoPro and Blackberry, two turnaround stories. In looking back, I realized the same mistakes applied to the now defunct Amherst. The framework that I lay out in the course elegantly encapsulates the essence of my earlier winners, such as AMD and Tesla, which I have been holding for almost a decade now, and my newer winners, such as Palantir and Spotify. Once I synthesized the framework, I saw with clarity that GoPro and BlackBerry fell firmly outside it and were thus unlikely to fundamentally evolve well going forward. Although my wins far outweigh my losses, one of the many wonders of positive compounding, I could have saved over $300,000 by taking my two-hour deep dive course three years ago. By the way, link in the, in the description and it sells for just $199. In fact, I could have also earned even more than I have to date by instead investing that money in the companies that did actually fit the framework. The main takeaway from my framework is that the almost unreasonably consumer-centric, experimenting, and iterative companies tend to outpace the destructive forces of the market and thrive. As a result, the earning power tends to improve over time. And as you will see in the course, there are many specifics to that idea, but essentially that is the high-level takeaway of the framework. These companies also tend to achieve economies of scale share them with customers, and then proliferate the strength of their moats. Ultimately, every dollar a company makes is an added incentive for disruption, and by sharing economies of scale, companies greatly increase their odds of market dominance over time. With increasing share of the market comes more time to compound. A 50x investment, like my AMD holding, is in essence the result of a company taking the aforementioned three pillars customer centricity, experimentation, and pace of iteration to the extreme over a very long period of time. No one inside or outside the company can predict the future, but the company's extraordinary organizational properties broadly equate to more problems solved for customers over time at a lower cost. In turn, this tends to lead to higher levels of free cash flow per share over time, with the share price then following along, loosely in the short term, then increasingly tightly over the long term. Further, when a company of this sort taps into humanity's core wealth creation process, the upside is exponential. All humanity does to create wealth is process more information and unlock more energy. Companies that meaningfully advance our civilization's ability to do any of these two tend to be handsomely rewarded by the market. The above relationship is actually recursive. Advancing humanity's ability is a very hard thing to do which means that companies that do so are, by default, highly defensible operations if they get it right. Yet, they are only able to do so in the first place because of their extraordinary organizational properties, which over time equate into important work at a civilizational level. Check out this graph that I share in the screen now. In this graph, you can see how world GDP has evolved over the last two millennia, and you can see how about after this point, where I have my cursor on top of at the moment, world GDP has exponentiated. In my studies of history, I have come to the conclusion that this is due to more energy and more information process. Then, by the way, I challenge you to give me an alternative explanation. And if you have one, please drop it in the comments. There's no limit to the value these companies can add because there's no tangible limit to how much information and or energy we can work with. So long as their organizational properties remain strong, the possibility of exponential upside is very much on the table. If you zoom in, any curve is the result of many straight lines put together. Similarly, exponential increases in free cash flow per share are simply the result of constantly solving more problems for customers, decreasing the cost of doing so, and making it harder for, imitate, for others to imitate the operation. Humankind is not conceived to think exponentially, but we can perfectly understand the underlying drivers of nonlinear evolution. Check out this graph that I share on the screen now, which is very illustrative. Here you can see how we have a parabola that is simply made of straight lines, and this is universally true for any curve. Any curve or 
by extension, any, any nonlinear process is simply the result of uh, the accumulation of many linear processes over time. It sounds philosophical, but essentially, if you go back to the idea of what makes an exponentially higher stock over time, it's, of course, exponentially higher levels of free cash flow per share. But then why does that happen? It's because every day there's a linear process going on with the company paying attention to how they can solve more problems for customers at a lower cost in a way that is increasingly harder to imitate. And every incremental step, every linear increment over time in those three drivers equates to an exponentially better business over time. Over longer time horizons, these companies also tend, tend to evolve into platforms. They bring to the world a step change in the price to quality ratio of some fundamental components of the economy. For instance, by heavily investing in, the, in its electronic inventory system, Walmart instantiated a new dimension of retail, which, is, which in fact still has a lot of room to grow by expanding internationally. You can see in this graph how, as a result of simply focusing on giving customers better deals over time in a way that is increasingly harder to imitate, the stock has done quite a right since IPO. It's up 17,000% over the last few decades with essentially Walmart having lots of upside ahead today in terms of growing internationally and so forth. You may think that Walmart is just a supermarket chain, but it's actually a hyper-efficient retail information processing machine. All it does is connect suppliers and customers, but it does so in a way that is incredibly hard to imitate, and it's getting exponentially harder over time. In essence, Walmart is just electrons flowing back and forth that culminate in consumers getting better deals. The above leads me to think that a company that does not fit in the above blueprint is essentially a waste of time. Of course, not all companies that do well must fit in this framework, but with our ability to process information increasing exponentially across the board, this framework rides on the back of the more prominent tailwinds of our time. Although GoPro is quite customer-centric, the business does not tap into, into humanity's core wealth creation mechanism. Although it does sell an essential tool for content creators, there is really no need to buy a new camera yearly. GoPro therefore does not solve any acute customer pain, which has made the turnaround choppy. Over the past year and a half, the initially successful turnaround has seen severe headwinds. And by the way, if you want to see how successful the turnaround was around a year or two ago, check out the free cash flow levels. They increased spectacularly because the new strategy was working. But what I'm saying is I was missing the point. This is a business that does nothing essential for humanity, and it doesn't fit in the framework that I'm describing, that I describe in the course, by the way, link in the description for just $199. These headwinds have impacted other businesses too, but the payoff for waiting around in GoPro is much lower than in a business like Hims, for example, that I wrote a deep dive on last month. There is no exponential growth prospect ahead. GoPro is thus a waste of time, and that is why I have decided to terminate my position. In turn, BlackBerry's real-time operating system, QNX, is embedded in over 200 million cars on the road today. BlackBerry is currently working on BlackBerry Ivy, which promises to connect these cars and create a single network in which they can share information. BlackBerry, therefore, could meaning, mean, meaningfully tap into humanity's wealth creation matrix, but it has an awful culture. The company is highly political, with seemingly low levels of customer centricity and has a tremendously slow pace of iteration. The odds that it can therefore create value from its QNX installed base are much lower than I would have liked. These two businesses, GoPro and BlackBerry, can do well going forward, but I'd rather use my time by investing in a company that perfectly fits the framework that I have laid out in this podcast thus far. Additionally, in August 2023, Amris filed for bankruptcy. The company's biomanufacturing platform had great potential, but it wasn't being directed towards solving a customer pain. Amherst was trying to monetize the platform by growing its proprietary brands, but customers had plenty of alternatives. In theory, Amherst's products were appealing to customers because they were more sustainably produced and had a superior performance to alternatives. I actually still am a consumer of one of their products called Terrasana, and I can confirm that the performance is superlative. But the product's differentiation was not enough to keep the company afloat. Customers didn't actually need them, so then the operation failed. So then what are the key additions that I'm adding to my framework after these investment failures that you can take away for yourself in order so that you can avoid these investment mistakes going forward? 
So essentially, the mistakes that I've talked about can be avoided by only contemplating companies with one, an evident and obsessive customer centricity, two, a strong track record of high iteration and experimentation, which ideally manifests into the company's products defeating that of companies that are much larger and have much larger resources, three, an ability to identify and solve a higher volume of acute customer pains over time at an increasingly lower cost while producing more cash. Further, oftentimes the market disregards companies with a net loss and positive cash from operations. Such companies do not actually lose money, which sometimes leaves excellent organizations ripe for the picking. Amaris, however, had negative cash from operations because it wasn't solving any acute customer pain. And it wasn't going through the third dynamic that I talked about, which is identifying a higher volume of acute customer pains over time, fixing them at an increasingly lower cost while producing more cash. It wasn't doing that. It was doing right the opposite. And that is what ultimately led the company to bankruptcy and cost me a permanent loss of capital. Going forward, I will thus be additionally wary of investing in companies with negative cash from operations. However, I knew and was always very vocal about Amaris's risk of bankruptcy. And although I did lose 100% of the money investment, the position was therefore sufficiently small enough for the loss to be immaterial to my portfolio. On the other hand, the GoPro and BlackBerry investments have not led to a permanent loss of capital, although the two investments are down considerably. I have simultaneously found a company that checks all the requisites per the current state of the framework and whose stock has also been demolished. I have therefore moved my money from GoPro and BlackBerry into HIMSS. I have invested in the company primarily because of the company's seemingly extraordinary organizational properties, together with the fact that it is solving a growing volume of acute customer needs at a gradually lower cost in a way that is increasingly harder to imitate. HIMSS is a deflationary force in the otherwise highly inflationary U.S. healthcare sector and has managed to print positive cash from operations without participating in the incumbent system, which is extraordinary. HIMSS has also created its own healthcare infrastructure, which it iterates on at a high pace to ultimately bring more convenient savings and better outcomes to patients. If you want to learn more about HIMSS, watch my deep dive for free, which if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to link to just as this video ends. So thank you very much for joining me and on the, until next time.